Hey Homo Sapiens, Parman here. Welcome to another video. Welcome to the lab. Two identical cells. We finally understand the proliferation aspect, yay. Two stops. Yes, you heard me right. Welcome to the lab. With so many of us stuck at home, it's hard for us biology enthusiasts to do any hands-on work, but why not bring the lab into your home? Now, quick disclaimer that the videos I'll be using later on in the video to kind of bring that lab experience to life are not mine, but you can find all the credits and links in the description box down below. Today, we'll be taking a look at the proliferation and differentiation of stem cells in a lab setting. If you need a quick lesson or refresher on what stem cells are, you can watch my six minute intro on them right there, but we'll do a quick review right now too. To be a stem cell, the cell needs to check off two boxes. Number one is that it needs to be self-renewing, meaning it can make copies of itself. And two, the cell needs to be able to differentiate. That means it can turn into more specific cell types. Think of it like this. This is a writing utensil, and it's good for everything from jotting down grocery lists to doing calligraphy. Now this, is a calligraphy pen, and it's very good at its job of, you guessed it, doing calligraphy, but it's not very good at jotting down grocery lists. It's the same thing with stem cells. The stem cell at the very top of that diagram is pluripotent, meaning it can turn into a bunch of different cell types, but the cells at the bottom are differentiated, and that means they have very specific roles. Now that we have some specifics out of the way, it's time to do some lab work. Here, I have some embryonic stem cells, or ESCs. Not actually though, this is just our performance. But they're super tiny, so you can't see them. For reference, ESCs are about 12 to 13 micrometers in length, while the diameter of a cross-section of a fairly thin human hair is 17 micrometers. Now, ESCs are pluripotent. I mentioned pluripotency before, but to be more specific, Pluripotent stem cells can turn into any cell type in the entire body, except for extra embryonic ones, like cells in the placenta. If we bring an embryonic stem cell under a microscope, you can see it proliferating or multiplying right now. Now here, the cell cycle, which we'll talk about in a sec, has been significantly sped up for your viewing pleasure. Normally, it takes about 16 hours per cell cycle. What is the cell cycle? It's the process through which cells multiply or proliferate. The original cell that the other cells come from is called the mother cell or parent cell. And the two cells that are left at the end of the cell cycle are called the daughter cells with respect to the mother cell or sister cells with respect to each other. To help us better understand this, let's get a real life visual. This is a mesenchymal stem cell actually going through the cell cycle. Doesn't it look absolutely amazing? Mesenchymal stem cells are multipotent stem cells in the bone marrow that help with making and repairing skeletal tissues like cartilage, bone, and fat. Look at it separating into two identical cells. Isn't it so cool? But what makes stem cells even cooler is their so-called asymmetric cell division. By definition, this is when two sister cells have different fates or become two different cell types. If you remember from the beginning of the video, I mentioned how stem cells can differentiate. When two regular somatic or fully differentiated cells undergo the cell cycle, they're just making two identical copies of themselves. But with stem cells, they both need to self-renew and differentiate. Just a quick note, that asymmetric cell division, or ACD, isn't always observed with embryonic stem cells and hematopoietic or blood stem cells in culture, meaning in a lab. But based on my research, nearly all stem cells um, do undergo ACD in vivo, that means inside the body. Now with that in mind, how does ACD work anyways? What determines the difference 
between ACD and its symmetric counterpart lies in two categories of intrinsic and extrinsic factors. Intrinsic factors include uh, sulfate determinants like NUM, RNA, polarity, and more. During the early stages of the cell cycle, NUM, a signaling inhibitor, which means uh, it stops signals, is spread evenly all throughout the cytoplasm or cell juice, but then becomes localized during ACD. The sister cell that gets the higher level of NUM suppresses signals and differentiates, while the sister cell with the lower level um, expresses the same stem cell rate as the mother cell. When this was done with lung cells, they found that NUM levels were much higher in the apical side than in the basal side, which is consistent with what we know about which side differentiates and which one continues down the stem cell path. Let's use an analogy involving Plato to better understand this. At first, all of the NUM in dark green is evenly spread out in the cytoplasm in light green, but when the cell divides, one of them takes more of the NUM than the other. So now this one with more NUM differentiates, while this one with less NUM continues its stemness. As for extrinsic factors, one major factor is dividing in a way where one of the sister cells remains in contact with the stem cell niche while the other one doesn't. Think of it like this. There are two identical twins that are separated at birth. One of them stays with their genetic parents and so ends up pretty similar to them, not just genetically, but also in terms of habits and behaviors. But the other one goes to live with a super different family. And so it differentiates and um, it ends up pretty different than the other twin, even though they came from the same parents. We finally understand the proliferation aspect, yay. But what if we want to turn our embryonic stem cells, our ESCs, into a more specific cell type, like a hematopoietic stem cell, an HSC, or a blood stem cell? We need a few things to turn it into an HSC, like the transcription factor, HOXP4, the media combined with SCF, IL-3, IL-6, uh, FLT3L, GCSF, BMP4, and some others. But let's focus on the transcription factor and the media for this video. Before we can actually do anything though, we need to learn some pipette basics. Pipettes are basically fancy eyedroppers that are super accurate and measure in microliters. That's one thousandth of a milliliter. First off, you have the plunger or push button that pushes out the liquid. It has two stops. When you're drawing liquid into the pipette, you first push the plunger to the first stop. You then insert the pipette into the liquid as deep as needed, but as little as possible. Then slowly let the plunger come back up so the liquid is sucked in. Wait a little bit before removing the tip from the container. Now to expel the liquid, all you do is press down to the first stop again. And once nothing else is coming down, push beyond that to the second stop. This expels that last little bit of liquid. Make sure to hold down the button until the tip isn't touching the liquid anymore, because if you let go, you might suck some liquid back in. Now jumping right into our differentiation process, first we're going to incubate the ESCs in 1 mg per milliliter collagenase type 4 for 20 minutes, and then scrape them off the petri dishes. We want to passage the cells when they're 90 to 100% confluent. Confluence is just the percentage of surface area that the cells are covering. We also want to make sure that the cells are large, compact, and have dense centers compared to the edges, as we can see right here, and are mostly covering the petri dish. This is at 20 times magnification. Then at 400 times magnification, we can take a look and check for a high nucleus to cell ratio, which means the nucleus takes up most of the cell. What even is passaging? Passaging is done to ensure that the cell line can continue growing. All you're doing is dividing the cells you have right now into more dishes so that it can continue on. We have both clump passaging and single cell passaging, and they're pretty much what they sound like, with clump passaging being done in clumps and single cell passaging being done with single cells. Now in this case, we're going to be using clump passaging. 
back to this collagenase type 4 we were talking about. It's an enzyme, and enzymes help speed up biochemical reactions. Now this specific enzyme helps dissociate stem cell colonies from the dish. Think of it like this. You have one of those annoying, nasty barcode stickers stuck on a nice decoration, and it just won't come off. So you run it underwater as you scrape the sticker off. Now in this case, the collagenase type 4 is like the water. But just like how you need to keep scraping to get the sticker off, you have to scrape the dish with a glass pipette and collect the cells by a gentle centrifugation. Now we're going to wash the detached colonies once in the differentiation medium and then resuspend them in the medium. Next, we're going to transfer the colonies to sterile ultra-low attachment 6 wall plates and incubate them at 37 degrees Celsius in 5% carbon dioxide. While we're waiting for the colonies to differentiate, we'll replace the medium every 2 to 3 days. And if you remember from before, we're going to add some stem cell factor, FLT3 ligand, interleukin-3 or IL-3, IL-6, granulocyte colony stimulating factor, and bone morphogenetic protein-4 to the differentiation medium. Now on to the transcription factor, HOXB4. Using the plasmid PTP6, we transfect either HOXB4 or green fluorescent protein, also known as GFP, into the cells. Here, the PTP6 acts as a container of sorts that helps us get our HOXB4 or GFP into the cell. Transfection is just introducing new material into the cell as free nucleic acid, but you don't have to worry about that part for now. To make sure that the transfection is stable, we're going to plate three confluent 60 millimeter plates containing approximately 2,000 ESC colonies onto one six-well gelatin-coated plate containing 5 times 10 to the 4 feeders. The function of feeder cells is pretty similar to what it sounds like. They feed our desired cells. They're a layer on the bottom of the dish, and they can't proliferate. Instead, uh, they provide a mixture of extracellular matrix components and growth factors that help our desired cells, in this case the stem cells, thrive. After 48 hours, we're going to transfect the cells using lipofectamine 2000, which helps increase transfection efficiency. And three days after that, we're going to pass the cells onto 60 millimeter gelatin coated tissue culture plates containing pyromycin resistant mouse fetal fibroblasts as feeders. After three more days, we're going to add pyromycin. And after 12 days, we pick the pyromycin resistant colonies that we find, dissociate them, and plate them onto 24 well gelatin coated feeder containing plates and let them expand. Yay! Let's back up a second. Why this whole pyromycin procedure? Well, based on my research, certain antibiotics act as selection agents where they help researchers select certain transfected cells. Um, also, the pyromycin antibiotic helps prevent the growth of gram-positive bacteria in uh, various animal and insect cells. And what was the purpose of the GFPs? Well, the research paper this lab was based on was trying to see whether the overexpression of HOXB4 would lead to the differentiation of ESCs into HSCs, which it did. And so they used um, GFP in place of HOXB4 in certain cells as a control for the effect of transfection. Since we're all lab experts now, we should talk about two other terms that get thrown around a lot, PBS and torturation. Unfortunately, PBS is not referring to the amazing TV channel, PBS, but the buffer solution uh, that helps maintain a constant pH, and it's short for phosphate buffered saline. It's used to dilute solutions, uh, to rinse containers with cells inside them, and more. Torturation is creating a uniform solution by mixing thoroughly. For example, in the case of single cell pathogen, if the cell colonies are too big, you might triturate the suspension by aspirating it into a pipette and then expelling it multiple times to get the colonies to uniform sizes. And there you have it! You've got some basics of working at a lab with stem cells. 
Don't forget to check out the description box down below for some other amazing videos to watch as well as all my references. I hope you enjoyed this video and I'll catch you in the next one. Bye!